Welcome to worship this morning. This has been a week of repeated bad news. We come together this morning to hear the good news that allows us to rejoice in the midst of trial and tribulation and killing. The good news that God is still in control. The good news of God's love that allows us to rejoice even as we mourn for black, for white, for police and civilians alike. I ask you to, re- to stand as you are able and we sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also you. you are a treasured people of the Lord. Keep the words of the Lord in your hearts, teach them to your children. One does not live by bread alone. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, your mercy delights us, and the world longs for your loving care. Hear the cries of everyone in need, and turn our hearts to love our neighbors with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the word. The first reading is from Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors when you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, 
who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Please respond to Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame, rather let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you I have trusted all the day long. Remember Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You are gracious and upright, O Lord. Therefore, you teach sinners in your ways. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. The second reading is from Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Ephesus, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you pre be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. 
And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. Sisters and brothers, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. What do you think of when you hear the words, Good Samaritan? Maybe you think of a hospital or a nursing home that goes by that name, where people are healed or housed when they're sick or old. Maybe you think of the person who comes to the aid when there's an accident on the road, as dangerous as that might be. Or maybe simply the person who stops to help you change a tire. What if it's you who's stopping, but the man in need wears a Muslim headdress? How willing would you be to lend aid? There was a study not long ago where the researchers took an actor and put him in a Muslim headdress beside a car that was obviously in need of a change of tire. This man was to look obviously helpless to do anything about it. And in the midst of a busy city, nearly no one stopped to render him aid. Only one African-American man stopped. And his reason, it was a loving thing to do. It was a loving thing to do. Or what if it was you needing that tire changed and an uncertain type of individual came to lead your, render your help? Would you accept it? If you went to the doctor and the doctor they gave you was an Iraqi, would you accept his help? A pious religious leader comes to Jesus and asks him, how do I get to heaven? How do I attain eternal life? And Jesus says, you know that, right? You obey the law. Love your neighbor. Love God. But wanting to justify himself, the Bible says, he wants to make certain he's helping the right people. So he says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him a story about a man who falls among thieves on a very dangerous road who strip him and beat him and leave him for dead. And two pious religious leaders come from the temple where they've been worshiping and praying and praising God and they pass by on the other side. The Bible doesn't even necessarily say that they saw him. But if they did, 
they knew that this was a dangerous activity to get their hands dirty with. First of all, this man was unclean. Ceremonially, blood was not to be touched. This was before the days of the latex gloves, before any knowledge of germs. This was just not to have anything to do with. Besides, who knew who this man was? He might be the enemy. He might be somebody not deserving of his help. And thirdly, it was an inconvenience of time. But a Samaritan comes by, one who was already despised and left out, by whom anybody with any righteous sense about them would pass by whether he was healthy or in need. This despised individual dares to come close to the injured man, and not only does he dress his wounds, he puts him on his donkey, therefore depriving himself of his comfort, and then takes him to an inn where he not only pays for one night's lodging, but for anything that the man might need until he was healthy and the Samaritan could return. This despised and neglected and outcast individual, the Samaritan, gave of his time, of his comfort, of his resources, even of his dignity to help one who was likewise despised and outcast and left for dead. In this story, we see two examples of Jesus. On the one hand, the Jesus who was despised and neglected and left for dead on the cross. On the other, the one who emptied himself, giving even his whole life so that you and I might have life. He did not pass by on the other side. He did not look away in disgust, but he came, became one with us that we might become one with him. You may have seen Jeremy Porter on the news yesterday morning. Jeremy is a, a jazz singer who grew up with a mother who was a preacher and a teacher of humility and compassion who inspired in Jeremy a song called Take Me to the Alley, Take Me to the Alley, where unseemly things might happen, but where those who are poor and afflicted dwell. The alley is a street in Bakersfield. Take me to the alley. Take me to the afflicted one. It's kind of Skid Row. It was Take when I was a child. And that's where my mother wanted to be. She wanted to go to the places where people needed her the most. It's a great to have somebody like that on your side. Yeah, yeah. It, it can be difficult as a child. Porter particularly remembers his mother's charity with the family meal at Thanksgivings. She went and fed the homeless first and brought the leftovers to the family. And we ate the scraps off the, the bones. At the time, we were outraged. Right. But now it's golden, golden, golden. I keep the memory and it's just like, I'm glad that I nibbled on the bones after a homeless person. It's, I'm like, I, I must say, I'm thankful to her, and uh, I'm thankful to her because she's given me a song. Thankful to the woman who inspired the song, who shared her child's Thanksgiving dinner with the homeless before giving it to them. Imagine the indignity of eating the scraps having been picked over by the homeless, becoming in essence one with them, hungry with them, needy with them. This is the lesson that Jeremy learned 
at his mother's table. Pine Ridge Retreat Center is a ministry of the ELCA. There people come to live with and learn from the people who live on the reservation, Native American men and women and children. Some come to do good deeds and then leave. And while the good deeds are appreciated by those who live there, more appreciated are those who come to listen and learn and in some way, shape, or form to become one with the people who live there. To get their hands dirty, but also to get their hearts dirty. To be spiritually united with those who they come to help. This week, we hear Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. This is not simply a story of good deeds done, as is often preached. Go and do likewise. In other words, go help somebody who's in need. But it is a story of becoming one with, of becoming like unto, in biblical language, the one who is in need of help of recognizing those willing to bend down and get their hands dirty with us. Those following in the footsteps of Jesus himself. It's a call to unity with all those who are suffering, whether they be people of color on the streets or those charged with their protection. Again, getting our hands dirty and our hearts dirty by becoming one and thereby unifying enemies, bringing them together. Enemies, Christian and Muslim, on the battlefield become partners in love as recently Muslim and Christian leaders got together to join hands in fighting poverty, to helping the poor and the neglected and the outcast. Jesus calls us to solidarity with the poor, the outcast, the least, the lost, the neglected. To live in the shadow of the cross of one who was himself despised and neglected and left for dead that you and I might be healed and live abundant life. Amen. Please rise as you are able and sing. Jesus.
is at the feet of our friends. In Christ you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray the holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Please turn and greet one another with that peace. I want to highlight some announcements for you here this morning. Um, talking about being one with folks, we, uh, we remember this morning um, Coral Kreplin, who is the uh, daughter of Elena and Cody Kreplin, who's being baptized today up in Highmore. So we celebrate with them. Um, next Sunday, our church council will meet following worship. Um, in our prayers this morning, we include uh, Gus Erickson, brother-in-law to uh, Vicki Broadcorp, who is having surgery this week. Remember Irene Keene, who is hospitalized um, in, in swing bed uh, over next door. Also, we want to remember all those who are involved in the camping ministry of our congregation, and also for Zachary and Nicholas, uh, our sons who are uh, going to be on the camping staff of a Royal Family Kids Camp uh, in Madison, uh, a, a ministry to abused and neglected children. So they'll be there for this week engaging uh, with those children. Other announcements that need to be brought to your attention? Um, at our Synod Assembly this year, um, one of the resolutions that was adopted that you have in your bulletin um, calls on our church-wide assembly, which meets next month, um, in what's called a memorial 
uh, which is a technical term for one body speaking to another. Uh, to repudiate or uh, denounce a doctrine that became law, a cooperative venture between church and state in the days before uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, a doctrine which allowed um, untold indignities to be visited not only upon uh, the Native Americans in this country, but people of other nations as well. I'm not as well able to speak to that as is Herb Wounded Head, a campus pastor at South Dakota State University. Um, he knows the indignities uh, faced by people of color, um, and I'm going to let you speak to him now about uh, the doctrine and about this resolution. Growing up as a, a, a native and a Norwegian Dane in the southeastern part of the state, I've experienced some things in my life that you generally don't experience if you are, how can we say it the nice way, pale. Um, <laughs> It, it's just weird. When, when, I, when I grew up, um, sometimes I would go into, say, um, a, a record store. And if it was during the summer, I'm a little darker than what I normally am, and, and you don't get any help from people. But yet the white kids come in, and they say, hey, how are you doing? Can we help you? Whereas me and my sisters were being watched. And we know, you can feel the watch. Right? If you've ever visited a congregation and you walk through the doors and you feel the watch, right? you know what that feels like. That's what it feels like in society if you're a Native American who doesn't really blend in all that well. Um, so there's things that are happening in our society. It still happens today. I didn't spend a whole lot of that because I've always been very, very uh, attuned to my Native Americanness, and so my friends too, but that means a lot of different things. When I was growing up, we would always play cowboys and Indians. There's one Indian. <laughs> and I said, there's 10 of you. I went, oh wait, it kind of worked out that way, didn't it? Um, in, the, in the long run. So I mean, you have these little things and, and these little opportunities that you find that you have to have a sense of humor about a lot of it. But when it becomes professional as you get older, I lived in Rapid City for a time. I've had, I worked on a farm since I was four, um, picking eggs and uh, taking care of chickens and pigs and cattle and stacking hay walking beans and all that stuff. I know how to work. So I went out into Rapid City and I tried to find a job. I couldn't find one. I would apply for jobs a friend of mine would apply for. I had more experience at whatever it was and he would get the job. I could not find a job for the life of me. And I'm like, what's going on? This has never been a problem for me. And I went, oh, I'm a wounded head. And nobody's met me. They don't know me. And they don't know the relationship. So to get into this topic, I think, means that it's very, very hard to spend time talking about a topic like this if we don't know one another. If we speak in the abstract, we can see it as more uh, of just talking points of where we find out where our differences lie. But if we have a relationship, and I try to avoid this conversation unless I have a relationship with people, because this is very, very important to me, as I'm not a mascot, I'm not a token Native American, I'm a human being, and I'm a human being called by Christ to live and walk in this world, just as you are. And so part of this is being able to find that this is not an abstract conversation for people. This is something that goes to the depth and breadth of who we are. And now I, I want to say that I don't presume to speak on behalf of all my Native brothers and sisters. I'm here presenting what is an overview of a counterpoint of history from an indigenous perspective. While yesterday I heard, it with apologies, to uh, Pastor Roy Nestal, that some might say Columbus discovered America. A different point of view might be that the Americas discovered Columbus. And we are already here. It's difficult to discover something that's already there with people living and thriving. So this doctrine of discovery is a, a historical document that I think it says in the resolution goes back to 1493. There was a papal bull that was developed before that and I don't remember the name of it, but it was in 1463 when Spain and Portugal were having a fight. And when Spain and Portugal were having a fight, the Pope at that time was Spanish, 
And he said that if you walk into a Portuguese area and you are a Christian and those people are not Christians and you see that they're not using the land the right way, you can take it. And so that led into this fight of, of happening with, with Christians and that formulated the doctrine of discovery. Same kind of thing that said in 1493, when you're over in the Americas and you see that there are some pagan Indians, as they were called back then, not using the land the way you think it should be and you're Christian, by all means, take it. I tried to do this in Brookings when somebody was building a new house. It, it doesn't work in reverse. I, if you get a call, Bishop, from the authorities in Brookings, I apologize. Just know that I've learned my lesson. So with that, the doctrine came about, and then there's this thing that we all learned about when we were in high school or maybe even in grade school about manifest destiny, that we are destined by God to go into this land and claim it and use it as God would have us do, which is all well and good if there was nobody there. In the abstract of that, there were people that were here, many people who died, many people who were eradicated, many people who were farmers, who were hunters, who were gatherers. The Arikara Mandan tribe uh, in North Dakota are well versed in being able to grow crops in North Dakota and in this plains land. So it's not like we didn't know what was going on. There were gov government policy notes you can look up, just Google Andrew Jackson, an Indian and see what you come up with. It's not pleasant. We, terms are used like savages, like heathens, heretics, stupid, warring, alcoholic. Those terms are still used today to describe native brothers and sisters, to describe me, lazy, uneducated, we are none of those things. I think the contemporary impact of all of that and the fallout and consequences and result is that we are seen as a people who are nothing. With that discovery of the, the doctrine of discovery, it treated Native Americans as if they did not matter. And my friends, we do matter. Just as you matter. Just as you have seen what it means to be a people of Christ, we too see what that means in our own way. Part of being a pastor is being able to go out into a congregation and see what God is up to. Not in the reverse. We do not bring God to people. God is already there. It's our job to interpret and see what's happening in the world today. I am Herbert Garfield Wounded Head III, which means there, was, there were three of us. Um, my grandpa Garfield passed away three years ago. Before he died, he shared this story with me. He said, Takoja, which means grandson in Lakota. He said, I had this vision the other night. And it was of wounded knee. And all you have to say is wounded knee to somebody who's Native American and you get shivers. It's like, yeah, we know. He said, it was, I had a picture of wounded knee and I was walking out there. And as I looked, I saw the ghosts of our brothers and sisters and our ancestors coming out of their graves and walking and singing and dancing. He says, I don't know what that means, but I have hope. And before I die, I know that my people, our people, will rise again. These are familiar words. As I, I heard that story, I thought of Ezekiel's call in the Valley of Dry Bones. And as God took Ezekiel to the Valley of Dry Bones and he said, I see before me nothing but dust and death. When will these dry bones live? These dry bones live when we find out that there is a way to be able to come together in reconciliation and trust and believe that God is still up to something. For people who are still in exile in their own land, just like the Israelites were, we understand that there is much work to do. There is much, much work to do. And for any of you that have visited the reservation, if you have conversations with people, you see that they still have hope. 
They have hope that their people will live. They have hope that their people will thrive and find a way to come together and be the people that they once were. I think this document is important because we need to do something to say not necessarily that we're sorry, but that there is a people who are hurting, who are lost and sacrificed and have given much. And if we do nothing, we assume that there is nothing wrong or that there was no injustice worth noting. This then reduces the people that have sacrificed and lost much to nothingness. My friends, there is a walk of atonement that needs to happen. And for apologies to my Game of Thrones fans that may have watched this, the Walk of Atonement is more than a one-time thing. For us as Lutherans, the Walk of Atonement is a daily rising out of our baptism. Each and every day understanding that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Forgiveness and reconciliation is a continual living in the baptismal promises that were made to us, that we made when we were confirmed, to be able to go out and live as a people of God, trusting that one another, that we are good. Forgiveness and reconciliation is more than a one-time thing. It's a constant work that is done in and through us. Washed anew each and every day, this is reconciliation work that's worth doing, not only for the Native people, but also for us. A friend of mine said, if you have questions about this, his name's Chuck Woodard. He's a retired professor at South Dakota State. And he tells his students who have problems with things like this, and they say, you know what? I wasn't there. I didn't do anything. I wasn't a part of this. And he says, yes, you may be right. You are not responsible for what happened there. But you are responsible to what happened there for you are beneficiaries of things that have happened in that time. This isn't a plea to make you feel bad. This isn't a plea to say that you should be guilty and ashamed of what happened. This is a plea for unity, to be reunited as brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, the walk of reconciliation occurs each and every day. For some of us, just about every 15 minutes, which I think I took. So. Thank you. God has blessed us with innumerable gifts. We return thanks with our tithes and our offerings.
Lord of wisdom, give us knowledge of your will and spiritual understanding that we might recognize our neighbors in need and be willing to serve them. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of time, we ask that you would strengthen us with your power and enable us to endure suffering with patience while joyfully giving thanks to you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, our protector, guard your children from all harmful things of this world that all might live their lives in safety. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, our healer, mend the brokenness of all those who are hurting, black and white, people of all colors, police and civilians. Be with those who are ill or in physical pain. We especially remember Gus and Irene and Carl and Calvin and Ed and Ryan and Nancy and Erica and Ken and Christy and Sonny and Jack and Jason and Conrad and Jackie and Stephen and Jake. Strengthen them in body and soul that they may be made whole. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of light, <clears throat> we pray that you would remove the darkness that seems to overwhelm our earth in these days. Help your people to live in unity and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Comforting God, we pray for those whose hands have made the shawls that hang from the altar and those who will receive them, that they may be symbols of your strength and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, our Redeemer, you have shown love to us and for all the saints through the power of the resurrection. May we be counted among your holy ones and be raised to newness of life. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Lead On, O King Eternal.